Emerging Opportunities in Biotechnology. I'm Dr. Chris Oglum. I'm the director for the Center of Biotechnology Education. I want to welcome all of you to our event tonight. And thank you for those of you who trudged through the snow and the rain to get here um, and to find this room. We're really appreciative that you're here and hope that our speakers, our alumni speakers, can give you um, some information about how to court, uh, chart your course and your path through our program as well as get your next job. Today, Dr. Robert Lessig is here with us as well, and Rachel Romano, who's our um, academic coordinator for the program, is in the room as well. So I want to welcome you and to welcome our speakers tonight. We have Sarah Long, who is representing the MB program and the alumni MB program. Namisha Namagata, who is uh, a graduate of the MS in Biotechnology program, and Apala Chatterjee, who is a graduate of the MS in Bioinformatics program. And the way we're going to structure this is I'm going to ask them a couple of questions to just tell us about their experiences and their experience in the program, and then we're going to open the floor up to you because I'm sure students here have lots of questions. So um, the first question I have for all of you is just to give us a brief introduction of yourself and what you're doing right now. Um, so I'm Apala, and I work at the University of uh, Maryland in the School of Medicine in the Institute of Genome Sciences. And um, so far, I've been working on 16S metagenomic data analysis, building pipelines, maintaining and upgrading pipelines, things like that. Slowly moving into transcriptomics and RNA-seq technology. Um, again, doing the same thing, building pipelines and maintaining them. Yeah. Let's do something a little less complicated. <laughs> um, uh, I'm Sarah Long, and I work for um, a company. Uh, we do analytics for oncology. Uh, previous, uh, prior to that, I did. Um, I like to sell things. I worked for a company called NatHealth, and we did um, molecular tumor profiling, whole genome, whole transcriptome, quantitative proteomics. Um, before that, I worked for um, Myriad, which uh, we did hereditary cancer screening for um, patients at risk for cancer. And before that, I was a student in the. Um, Biotech and Enterprise program. Hi, I'm Namisha. Oh, this is working. It's on. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm the CTO Operations Coordinator for um, Population Health at LifeBridge Health. So I es essentially oversee um, 12 public health programs that are working with patients to address social determinants of health. So that can be early street violence, domestic violence, perinatal depression, diabetes, heart disease. There's a lot of them that we're working on. Um, I've been with LifeBridge about two and a half years now, so um, it's been a great journey for me to learn and grow and learn about Baltimore City and the disparities there. Thank you. So my first question for each one of you is, let's start back when you were in the program. What's the one thing in the program that you did that you think was the most valuable to you as you move through your career? Um, for me, it was definitely working with some of the amazing professors you have at, like, just as contacts, the classes you take. Um, I'm sure if you guys like actually try and talk to your professors and stuff like that, you will form a rapport. And in fact, I, my um, internship that I did at uh, University of Maryland was through Dr. Salzberg, who introduced me to everybody he knows at University of Maryland. And I definitely think networking is a good thing to focus on at this point. And maybe rotating different labs and doing certain projects with each of them that would be a definite, definitely, I'm glad I did that, yeah. Um, I made myself some notes. Uh, so if, I went to this night when I um, was a student, and I think um, if I were to give you guys some advice, it would be um, about creating those same connections. Those connections are going to create value. So I don't want anyone to leave this room without meeting everybody here on the way out. It's not creepy, it's not weird. Exchange some email addresses. I guarantee you somebody in this room is gonna do something pretty great. Um, you know, my colleagues um, have meant so much to me personally, but also um, professionally. Somebody here is gonna do something big if I don't beat you to it. And um, for me, every time I was able to make a career um, move, I was able to check in with some people um, from Hopkins, and that would be either um, students that I graduated with who are still, um, you know, I wish I would have done an even better job of that. I, I did a pretty good job of that, but um, making certain that I stay connected with some of my professors that I really like, I'll still reach back to people, um, some of my 
favorite classes that I took. I think the, the Masters in Biotech and Entrepreneurship really gave me a lot more flexibility to be able to kind of get out of my lane, to make certain that you use the time that you have to take a course about something that you know nothing about, that you think you will probably fail and just like hang on for dear life. Because if you don't know anything about personalized medicine, it can be really, um, it can be really intimidating to say, okay, well, I'm going to go take a class and pay three thousand dollars or four. I don't even want to know what it is now, but to, to go and take a class at Johns Hopkins, right? Because that seems like a, a reach. But if you don't reach an experiment now, nobody's going to give you the opportunity to do that professionally, um, because then you're wasting the company's money for them to train you. But if you can go forward and say, look, I've already done X, Y, Z. Even if it's I've listened to one speaker, I think um, one of the things that I would have done more of is when I get to know what my friends are taking when they have guest speakers, finding out if it's okay to come to even just that one guest lecture. A lot of um, professors, will, when they bring somebody in, the speaker wants to see a lot of students there and they want to have an impact so they don't mind if extra people um, stay in. I think I... Um, some of my favorite classes were with um, Ken Carter. He did kind of like a mini incubator where we went and had um, an idea that you took from tech transfer or some sort of patent that you created your own uh, business. And doing that, you know, with somebody who's actually done that and had some mild success and is entertaining. Not only is it, I mean, it, you know, and it has to sort of be fun or you'll, you'll not, you, you don't even want to participate if it comes work. But if, um, and then another thing, that if, <clears throat> if I were sitting where you are, so don't just stay in your lane, but also when you go out and you decide you want to be bioinformatics or you want to be in personalized medicine, and I can tell you why I chose exactly what I did, but um, make certain that you understand all parts of the business, right? Because when you're in an interview, you need to be able to speak intelligently about commercialization. You need to be able to speak intelligently about tech transfer. If you don't know, understand these things, um, you're not going to be able to understand the business side of biotech. And we can be really valuable scientists and great, I love that it's all women here. You can be really, really valuable in one area, but if you don't understand the business, the business is how they make money, right? So um, commercialization, tax transfer, the regulatory affairs, because everything in biotech is regulated. Genomics isn't, molecular testing isn't yet controlled by the FDA. I hope they don't, because they can stifle some innovation. But understand, um, how patents work, where are, you know, how the stuff leaves from the NIH and uh, turns around and is at Hopkins and then somebody funds it and becomes part of an incubator. There's a lot of opportunities here to take tours of incubators. The thing is, while you're a student and while before you graduated, there are going to be a whole bunch of people willing to help the student. That may not, that you can still do it, you can still leverage it as a recent graduate, but you might not be able to do it as well if they're not helping a student or having a student sit in on something or giving um, a student group, and a group can just be you and your friends, a tour of whatever it is you're interested in. And that allows you to put your toe in before you dedicate the next two years or six months or however long it is and draw a salary from them to see whether or not you like it. I wish I would have done more of that. So that's... Let me show you. I'll piggyback a little bit off of both what of what both of them have said, but mostly that for me, what I found most valuable one, Hopkins is at the end of the day a brand, and you have to remember that you can leverage the fact that you go to Johns Hopkins towards learning, growing, experiencing things that you probably would not have had the privilege of doing otherwise. So make sure to remember that always, because I think I didn't realize that initially, but as I'm growing in my career, I noticed how important. Just saying that from Johns Hopkins makes a difference in the conversation. Um, but the other part that's really important and to me was critical was that I walked into the program saying, I'm gonna walk, I'm gonna learn and grow and develop um, cost, cost efficient diagnostics for infectious disease, because that was like something that was a core interest for me walking into Hopkins. One semester in, I was like, I want to do public health. And I dropped my specialization and our concentration and then went into do a general biotech and got the chance to take different classes. I did epi, I did biostat, I did uh, infectious disease, I did microbiology. I picked an area of them that gave me the opportunity. Yeah, I'm not the ideal candidate that 
that walks out of the School of Public Health, but I'm, I'm also still walking out with very diverse experiences to bring to the table with biotech and public health, and that was something that um, I think the program gives a great opportunity for you to take advantage of. So my biggest takeaway was the fact that I could just take as many different courses as I wanted and grow in whatever direction I wanted to. Thank you. You all kind of touched on my next question a little bit, but um, what's one thing you would do differently? If you had to come back, what would you tell them to do differently from what you may have done? Um, definitely don't be afraid of reaching out to professors. Um, I really do wish that I didn't, I mean, I, I, did, I was pretty um, good with talking to professors and stuff like that, but um, sometimes I would not want to ask certain questions, I don't want to seem stupid, you know, like just, just ask. It's your job to be a student right now. You're never going to get this chance again unless you, of course, enroll in another course uh, or become a no. grad student, <laughs> you know, something like that. But um, yeah, definitely ask as many questions as you can. Um, of course, don't waste their time, but ask, ask good questions, read more, read a lot of articles. Um, a lot of times you tend to kind of, you tend to kind of just like fulfill the requirements of the program in order to get a good grade. A lot of times we know what to do to get a good grade and we stop there. Um, and where that really holds you back is when you actually step into the real world, right? Because now you know all that, you have all that textbook information, but if they ask you to write a simple code or like do a simple task um, and you have to think on your feet, you don't, you're not able to. And therefore, you won't interview as well if you do that. Just having Hopkins as, on your uh, resume is enough to get people to take you seriously and actually give you an interview. Um, I would definitely use your Hopkins, e Hopkins email ID to send emails to everybody because um, people will immediately respond to your emails for sure. Um, don't use your Gmail, use your Hopkins ID. <laughs> That's, that, should be, that should be one of the takeaways. But yeah, definitely ask questions, definitely you know, read more um, papers, be on touch. Like suppose, um, so if I'm a bioinformatician, I'm definitely uh, gonna read more bioinformatics papers, make sure you're in touch with all the recent publications. Another thing that will be very helpful for you is if you are in touch with the publications and you want to, you want a job with somebody. Suppose you want a job with a professor at Hopkins. Um, it's much better if you already know the kind of research that they have most recently published, because now you can have an actual intelligent conversation with them, and they'll take you more seriously. Um, so yeah, definitely, those would be my big things. Sarah. Um, I think I would uh, not be in such a rush to graduate. I mean, it's lovely to say that now because I was um, you know, financing this with, with student loans, but um, I think that there were probably some more classes that would have benefited me. Another mistake I made um, was not really, um, I think an opportunity that we have in this program is teaching our graduates how to negotiate. I think learning a couple of sentences uh, based just a couple of sentences that you can say over and over again until you can say it with a straight face and say it with confidence. Based on my education and my background, I believe that X, Y, Z, and it's gotta be insane, it's gotta be obscene. I believe that 200,000 is a reasonable uh, base salary. No laughing, there's no laughing. Say it in the mirror until you can say it straight face because if you can't say it in straight face, no one else is. And then shut up. So the next person who speaks loses. And if you can get a couple of sentences in there for negotiating, because what is this all, what are we doing here? We're all in here to, to get a great degree to get a good job. And for me, it was just about money. I just wanted to make the most money that I possibly could afterwards. I made every decision on will this make me more money. And I think I did a really good job of that afterwards. And I, I stayed in touch with my advisor and sent her every offer that I got afterwards. And was like, you know, I know we can do better. I think that another mistake I made when I was graduating is um, thinking that I could do everything on my own, right? So I sat, I sat there and I, I read a book about writing a resume and I had all these things that I thought would be great on a resume. Three months later, I still didn't have a job and I was like, wow, guess what? I suck at resume writing. I paid somebody to look at my experience and who was a biotech person who this was her wheelhouse, right? This is, what she, this is how she made her money. And she wrote me a resume. I had a great job within one month afterwards. And that was 300 bucks. So you think about like, what, what you spend in your classes. And then at the end of the day, that little piece of paper is your advertisement. It's your Super Bowl ad 
of what, you know, of how you're going to get your resume. And I thought I could do it my own. Are you kidding me? Like, why did I, why did I think that? And I think also leveraging the location that you're in. Um, so if I were you, I would be focusing on genomics. I think that when you can make yourself valuable in, in um, genomics, where is genomics most valuable? Right now it's in oncology. There are a lot of conferences that come through, right? So um, in the area <clears throat> in um, D.C., there's a lot of really expensive conferences that come through where everybody's got a booth there. That we, You don't want to go to a biotech networking SOP SAS show where everybody's looking for a job, right? You want to go to the place where everybody's innovating, everybody's coming there to advertise their wares. You want to see firsthand, like a customer, like a buyer, what, who's doing what, where are the research, you want to be able to go into the white papers, you want to look at the um, posters and judge for yourself what company is coming out with the best uh, technology. And the location here is perfect for that. I mean, you have a whole bunch of uh, conferences that come in and out. You can sneak into the conferences. You can ask for somebody's badge. And it's like, they can be like 500 bucks. You can uh, contact them ahead of time and ask for a, a student. Again, you can sneak into these conferences. And we, you want to get to the area where everybody, you want to get to the place before they even post for a job. You want to make it so that they create a freaking job for you. And how you do that is getting there first, being informed, and saying, I'm from Johns Hopkins. You need me. Here's why. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You <laughs> should. Um, finally, like, complete contrast. I don't think when I was looking for jobs, I was looking at salary at all. Um, I was very focused on, I want to get a job in public health. I wanted to be very driven towards change for patients, change for communities. Um, which was a struggle, um, but something that I feel like I would have done differently is probably tried to get more experience outside the classroom. So I did an internship um, during the summer with a professor, with the head of the EPI department at Bloomberg School of Health, but um, I didn't get to work directly in the area that I wanted to work as much. So I did a lot of research on the back end, but my interest was more so working directly either with communities or patients. And I didn't get to do that to the extent that I would have liked to, which probably would have made me a stronger candidate when I left the program to have been able to say that. So I think I would have tried to get more hands-on experience doing whatever that might be that you're interested in doing, um, to enhance whether it's your resume or, or what you want to understand of the work that you're interested in doing. So you've already started going into how you went about getting your jobs, but that's my next question. What did you do after your degree or during your degree to be able to get that job that you have now? What did you do? And how did you prepare for that? So, yeah. Um, yeah, so my goal was all I like having options, you know? So <laughs> I wanted to make sure I had enough options and enough job offers and things like that. Again, like Nimicho was saying just now, you have to have hands-on experience. Without that experience, people are going to think, oh, I'm going to have to train this person. So when you talk to somebody or when you talk to a professor or whoever you're trying to get an interview with, you have to come off as smart. You have to come off as articulate. You should know. You should exude a certain amount of confidence where when you talk that people are like, oh, let me listen to what he or she has to say. Because if you don't, then you know, you're just another nerd who goes to Hopkins. You know, whatever. You know, nobody's going to take you seriously <coughs> otherwise. So when I was looking for a job, I was in talk with, talks with about three, three people. One of them was um, at Hopkins. The other job was at University of Maryland. Um, and there were two departments at University of Maryland. But um, the idea is to make sure that you know what research they're doing and that that's what you want to do. Um, if you, if, even if you get a job with somebody and you're not very interested in the subject that they are researching, it's not going to you know, appeal to you. When you talk to people, make sure you try and imagine what they'd be like as bosses, because initially they're going to seem very nice and seem very sweet. Especially since you guys are coming from Hopkins, they're going to want, most probably when you interview, I would say that they would, want, they would be trying to get you on their team. So they're going to tell you the nicest things and all that stuff. So talk to other employees at the workplace. Talk to, talk to as many people as you can associated with that person. You see that there's a second author, third author, like if it's a, a group, 
just look up all the people who are working with this person. What are they? What are they up to? You know, is this the? Uh, is this? Uh, what were the most recent publications from that place? Things like that are very important when you're looking at job, looking into into interviewing. Um, another thing I would also suggest is um, stepping outside of. Uh, so, so I'm assuming everybody is part of Krieger. Everybody's everybody's part yeah. of the program. Everybody's yeah. in the biotech, bioinformatics. Oh, okay. So. And being, yeah, I would definitely, so in case, so for me, I'll give you an example. I was taking a couple of courses in Vinning School of Engineering as well, because it kind of introduces you to like a separate group of people who think slightly differently and have different set of contacts. So again, once you, so now you have like doubled your network uh, just by taking a different course, like something that's part, that counts towards your credits, but is slightly different. Um, or is part of a different course or part of a different school. So it introduces you into a different circle of people who can advise you and connect you to other people. So definitely when you start, like, and also I would just say that it's never too late to start looking for a job. So um, if you guys, I started like, so I graduated in three semesters. I started looking for a job three months after I came here. And I was constantly talking to people. And if it was not a full-time position, it was a part-time position. And you know, if you're there, you know what's going on, guess who they're more likely to give a job offer to, the person who's there, or are they gonna go really spend time interviewing people and look for people? You know, you're already here. You could just have the job and start doing the work or continue doing the work that you are already doing. You know? Yeah. So as Apollo's advisor, I can tell you she did start looking for that job after three months and she kept in contact with me. And so one of the things I would just add is if you're starting to do your job search, do keep in contact with your advisor. Dr. Kondo's here, Dr. Lessig's here, but you can keep in, we're usually best reached by email, but keep us in posted and uh, we can help you with that. The other person that can help you with that job search is Ronnie White, who's our career services person. I don't know if Ronnie was around when you guys graduated, but she, um, she's been very good. She will not go and do the search for you, but she will help you get to the door. She'll help you with resume writing. She will help you even with some of your interview skills. So just to interject that, you have those resources. Ronnie is there and do take advantage of her. She is. She does come to the Homewood campus a couple of times a month. You can also Skype with her. Yeah, I, and like I she's can vouch and say that she's great. Yeah, <laughs> I've taken advantage of her services and all of you should because it's part of the program. Yeah, so you take advantage of it. You pay right. for it. Yeah, exactly, that's what I was about to say. I mean. You guys are paying a lot of money. You need to use every single resource available to you. You talk to a professor, you talk to somebody, you got a job for me? <laughs> <laughs> always, always. Just go I, can, I can vouch for it. <laughs> my advising, I can vouch for it. Yeah. <laughs> but she got a great job. And that's the and that's really what we hope for all of you is that you get out of here and, and hit your career goals. Right. Sarah, I'll stop talking. Um <laughs> So I, I would agree with uh, part of what you said, and I have a little bit of a different twist on uh, another part of it. So I agree that interviewing is the absolute worst, worst place for you to learn about that company, right? It's the first date. Everybody is on their best behavior. You're wearing your best clothes. You're not going to find out anything. And you have zero power. Everyone says, oh, it's this interactive conversational interview. That's bullshit. <laughs> you have no power until there's an offer. Mm -hmm. So that's not the time to learn. What I did and how, I mean, I should pay them a monthly fee is, um, every, so I'm always looking for a job. I'm looking for a job today. What I want to do next is I want to work with the uh, CRISPR, te CRISPR technology. I want to commercialize um, the first biotech that come, kit comes out for that. I want to, and it's probably going to be uh, for uh, blindness. That's, what, that's my prediction. I don't want to do anything with, um, even though I think we could commercialize it in, uh, uh, babies, I don't want people marching in the streets, I don't want that sort of controversy, I don't want to start small, but that's where I, what I want to do next. I'm not actively looking, I'm very happy with what I'm doing right now, but that, I, you always have to be thinking of like, what would you do next? Um, <clears throat> so, 10 minutes, every single night, instead of Reddit, 10 minutes on LinkedIn. Now, just give yourself 10 minutes, set a timer, go through, just start linking up with some people on um, LinkedIn. If you don't have something impressive to put on LinkedIn, just start putting some stuff that you're interested in. Copy and paste interests. And don't, it doesn't have to be your impressive resume. No one's really looking. Your picture, 
It doesn't have to be what you want it to look is friendly. Nothing thirsty, nothing spicy. <laughs> you want it to be friendly. You want it to look, because you, if it's too serious, then it's like, ah, you, know, you don't want to come off as um, too stiff. And when you reach out to somebody, the, the words aren't, do you have a job? The words are, can we chat? I'm really interested in your career path. Guess what? Everybody likes talking about themselves. Right. Say, so, can I get on your calendar for 15 minutes? Because I want to talk about you and show you love for 15 minutes at nauseum, no matter how much, whatever you want to tell me. And people will usually talk to you a little bit longer. Sometimes they're jerks. But in the chance that they're not, then you've got an inside track to what do you like about your job? Tell me a little bit of, you have to learn one phrase, tell me a little bit about your career path. And then shut up. And then just let them go. And if it's useful, fine, but nobody's paying $15. You know, nobody's paying money for your time, but it's you know, taking time out of their time. And if you feel comfortable at the end, because unlike these two really amazing women, I would just wanted to make some money. And so at the end, if I felt comfortable and if they had an interesting enough uh, career path, so I was interested in um, selling things. Hey, so what do you think, you know, what, what do you think about the career path in this, blah, blah, blah? What do you think the salary range would be for somebody like me just starting out? And then they'll tell you how much money they make. And then you can tell whether or not you want to go further <laughs> in what they do. Or say, okay, this company doesn't pay that well. I want to go into uh, something else. For me, um, I chose right after uh, grad school um, Myriad Genetics. Some think they're the devil, but they've got a great uh, training program. Everybody knows who Myriad Genetics is, and it gave me some experience in um, hereditary cancer screening. Would I have preferred to do something with women's health or become a Bikram yoga teacher? Damn right I would have. <laughs> that doesn't pay the bills. I was interested in who could, you know, who could make the most money starting out right away. This is so terrible. Starting out right away. That's what I was the most interested in because I figured. If I didn't like what I did, I could always switch, right? But there's like that trajectory. And um, if, if, it, if it didn't make me feel good, I could switch. And if uh, people irritated me, I could laugh all the way to the bank afterwards. Or if there's something else I wanted to do, I could do it after uh, 6 p.m. or whatever. Another thing is work from home as much as you can. I've taken a lot of calls from the Gymboree, from Kidsville uh, at an art class. Um, well, there's a man singing Spice, Spice Girls to my kid. so. As much flexibility as you can, there are going to be some times, um, obviously, that you travel. Try and make it as fun as possible, but LinkedIn, every night, 10 minutes. I don't want you posting about what you think about Donald Trump, because that could clear the room. You want to make certain that all you're doing is reading. You can let, don't even comment on anything. I don't even comment on anything. My stuff is really incognito. I don't spill my whole world, my whole life on it, as I just say, this is what I was doing, and I put like one sentence so that I don't ever deter anybody that there's still something to talk about more than what's on my um, LinkedIn, but it's LinkedIn, LinkedIn, LinkedIn. Say, hey, can we chat? I want to hear about your career path. Then get 15 minutes with that person, go further into that company, or switch directions. It's a lot less, you're not invested the way you are if you're going to get a job for three months. You can find out just as much. Oh, can you repeat the question? No, <laughs> I forget. Uh, this is about your job search. What are some of the things you did for your job search to get to where you are? Um, well, one was I definitely took advantage of the carrier services at Hopkins, and all of you should, because it's great. And I, I don't think my resume would look the way it does right now if they didn't provide the support and understanding what I needed to add on there. Um, I agree with you. I'm not. I, I don't think making money is a bad thing. I think I live in. I I lived in a very ideal world initially graduating. The and two of us would make like one good person. <laughs> <laughs> like if, like if we were just one person. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, I actually, like I mentioned before, wanted to transition very much into public health. Um, was definitely interested in tapping into biotech, but more wanted to work in public health. Um, so. I knew that walking out of the school, I probably wouldn't get the kind of job I wanted, and I didn't want to walk out with a graduate degree and be paid what an undergrad was getting paid, just because I didn't have the experience that, that probably other graduates would have had. So I wanted to understand, okay, if I'm not going to get paid, what, what would be ideal? What is the best way for me to accelerate my growth curve so I can get to where I want to faster? And my short-term goal was to get more actively involved in public health. My long-term goal was to move into global health. So I decided to start with community health and move upwards. 
Um, so I applied for a lot of fellowships. I applied with Global Health Corps, I applied with Baltimore Corps, I applied with fellowships all over the country, because the goal of most of these fellowships is to bring people who are uh, who have had some sort of experience already working, but accelerate your growth and leadership skills. And so that's what I did. I did the Baltimore Core Fellowship and focused on health equity in Baltimore City for a year and then moved on to my current role. So I stayed with the same organization. They hired me on after that as a senior operations coordinator. And I still work with them, so that's what I did. Thank you all. Um, I'm going to open the floor up to uh, students that are here. Do you have any questions for our speakers? You must have some. <laughs> the pressure's on. Go ahead. Uh, I'm going to repeat your question so we can record it. Uh, I just wanted to know, especially for the bioinformatics uh, person, that I'm you know, focusing on my career in bioinformatics quite a bit, but I also like uh, bench work. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask if you do any bench work as a bioinformatics. But does it call it a bench work too? <laughs> um, I have the option to. I choose not to because I don't enjoy it. Um, you can definitely. In fact, I would say that um, at some. I, I would definitely think that if you were able to do as much of the experiment as possible, um, that would definitely be to your advantage because I see that that there are in real life a lot of complications and miscommunications when and egos involved when there's more than one person doing something. So if you want to do bench work, you can find a gate that will let you do both. They're more than happy to have somebody who does more work so and has more skills. Yeah. Anyone else? Questions? Okay, go ahead. Uh, wait, so, so you're talking yeah. about um, mm -hmm. genomics and um, CRISPR and as, as kind of like areas of, of interest and in, in a kind yeah. of go forward. Is there other areas that you would encourage people to look into? Yes. Areas okay. of interest. So, areas that are going to make you money. First of all, when you can speak intelligently about personalized medicine, we're going to personalize everything. So when you have an opportunity to go to um, a DNA sequencing conference, um, if you have a chance to tour the Illumina lab, the next thing that's coming that's going to change everything in oncology is CAR-T therapy. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to start doing stem cell transplants for um, diabetes, for uh, autoimmune disorders, uh, so there are two companies right now that have something, um, and I don't like working for big companies because I don't think there's a lot of, you, you need to be getting to get a good name on your resume, and they have great training programs, but there's not always a lot of opportunities, right? So, and I, you would be a better person than I if you were ready for a startup right away out of grad school. So, um, the companies that I would watch, uh, Novartis has a um, CAR-T therapy out, there's another one, um, it's like, Camera or Camaraya, and then uh, another one, and um, understanding pay schedules. So I listen to a lot of uh, NPR in the morning about um, health and how they are having uh, different reimbursement strategies, understanding how these are going to be paid for, because nobody does yet. Uh, CAR-T therapy is like $800,000 a pop. Um, I'm working with insurance companies right now to figure out how to uh, pair the right lymphoma patients. Um, Novartis will do um, a payback for if it doesn't work. They're, they're really effective. The shit works. But mm -hmm. if uh, then they will not charge you for the drug, but there's like an ICU stay and there's like transplant doctors. It's just, it's a lot of logistics, right? But this is the direction that we're moving. When you have an ailment, we're going to come up with something just for you. And that's all there is to it. And I don't know what that means for public health. I do know what it means for public health, and that's shitty. But, um, <laughs> Where the money is right now is oncology. Um, where you need to go through and look where we're studying at the NIH, we're, we're studying the same crap over and over again, we're throwing the same sort of money. Um, and it's, it's, it's in uh, you know, diabetes and oncology and um, arthritis, but I think the best innovations that we're working on for genomics right now is oncology. And, with the, and prenatal testing. Again, I don't want anything to do with people marching in the streets because as soon as we start, you know, we can, but as soon as we do, that's going to stop me from making money because then we're going to start legislating it. Another thing to watch is to make certain that the FDA does not get their hands on these molecular tests because as soon as they start regulating, it's lovely to have CLIA, we want to make certain everything's clean, um, but when the FDA starts regulating, guess what? <laughs> We're all going to go to China to get this stuff done, and we're all going to go to other countries. Uh, they're going to do it fast, and the U.S. needs to be first on it because we have the science. 
So that's that's where I think the money's going to be made. So let me just uh, make uh, a couple of comments for you. For example, if you want to take a stem cell, we can have now, now have a concentration in regenerative and stem cell technologies. So if you want to take stem cell lab class, you can do that. There are courses there. Dr. Kondo is sitting here. She teaches a course in um, genomics and personalized medicine, which will give you at least an introduction to that. And Sarah, you probably don't know, but we now have an MS in individualized genomics and health as a degree program. Yes. So all of those things are to try and help you, but there are courses there if you need some advice as to what to take and where to go with those things, talk to your advisors, talk to us afterwards. Uh, Dr. Lessig. Yeah, I want to follow up on one thing you said about the employer is going to try to recruit you. Yeah. And it's good to talk to other employees and I say it's even good to go, go to lunch with them. Yeah. But how long do you think it takes to get a feel for them? Um, I would say it's more telling when you talk to people other than the person who's going to be interviewing you. Exactly. Um, so I would definitely look up people who, you know, report to this person, work with them every day, you know. You don't want to end up with a bad boss. Right. Do, you think, do you think you can find out pretty quickly? Yes, I think yes, so. I think so. Yeah, you, pretty quickly. I would say if you had, a, by your second or third lunch, you would have a good idea of whether or not you can tolerate this person <laughs> bossing you around. <laughs> Okay, no one was chasing me. I had no employers who wanted to interview me. I couldn't even get a chat with a recruiter, and that irritated me, and nobody wanted to go out to lunch with me. So the best I could do was, but that's okay because that, that was only, that was a function of the job I was after, because you know nobody wanted to give me that job. But if you can talk to somebody for 15 minutes, just like, I mean, it's just like speed dating, but for a job, right? You just really want to spend the least amount of time on the people that you don't want to talk to, and then you know whether or not you want to talk to that company further. And you don't have, it, you can have one bad apple in a company, right? You don't want to work for that person. But you want to talk to people who are um, peer, because they're going to have a good sense on, because all stability is an illusion now, right? So if you want to be where there's going to be innovation, overnight, you need to be ready for that place to close the doors, because it happens, and it doesn't have anything to do with you. And things can just go in another direction. But you, the, the things you take with you are your skills, your connections, um, the way you can talk about uh, your experience. Those are the things that no one can take from you. And building on what she just said, um, you're probably <coughs> going to be working with people in teams that don't include the person who interviewed you. So it's always a good idea to know the people you're going to be working with long term. Because if it's a teamwork, you, you know, one person could really be dragging the whole team down. And you don't know you don't know that if you're just talking to the boss before trying to group, yeah. And I think I mean at the end of the day, um, networking is really, really important. Um, like I mentioned before, take advantage of the fact that you go to Johns Hopkins. It makes a huge difference when you say that. Um, but Hopkins recently, I, I think it was about a year ago or maybe two, I'm not even sure at this point, um, created a more robust network for the alumni. And this is a cross and talking the entire Johns Hopkins. This isn't for our program alone. Um, and I know that that has been a great place too. Just the same questions I've always asked. Hey, I'm really interested in what you're doing. Can I know more about what you do right now or how you got to where you did? Because if you know where your pathway is, like what your maybe three year, five year goals are, um, it helps to kind of understand who you need to reach out to or who might be able to help you kind of understand how you can get there. So. Network is, is definitely a key element. And for me, in my fellowship, I actually built a very robust network because it was all very young, ambitious people working very different fields. It was design, uh, public policy, it was in education. It was all over the place because the goal was everybody's trying to accelerate their career. Um, and not just the people that we met there, but everybody else who was part of that larger network. I take advantage of that network to this day. And one of, one of the person there, his wife actually helped me negotiate to probably what in my current organization is, is the ceiling of what they would ever pay anybody for the role that I sit in. So I right now sit at a point where nobody else in the organization makes as much as I do. And, and to give me a bonus, they're actually really struggling because then they have to push me to a higher position and that would push me into a different bracket and they're just struggling with that. So I'm pushing for a different bracket right now. But that, I can only negotiate to that extent because somebody provided me the feedback on how to negotiate well for myself. Yeah. And like know my worth and talk about my worth at an interview. Yeah. Other questions? Go ahead. Uh, sure. Yes, for the bioinformatics. Mm -hmm. This uh, 
looking at the field and uh, where you work, what would you say is the most important kind of programming program to learn before that I actually did this Okay, so are you talking about languages? Yeah, like R, math, or any other type of program that you can use. I, my advice would be not to get stuck on a programming language. So before I joined my job, I was very, I, I used to use Python and R a lot, but when I joined them, turns out all their scripts written from 10, 12, 13 years ago are in Perl. <laughs> and now I have to work in Perl so that uh, people on my team or people I've been working with are going to be able to understand it properly or like, you know, it's easy for them to just kind of make everything work together. Um, I would say if you were focusing on a programming language, Python and R would be my pick right now. Um, definitely R because if you're looking into bioinformatics, uh, you want to be able to be like, here, look at this image. This is what your data is telling me, you know? Um, so visualization is important and Python because it's just easy. It's the easiest one to use in Microsoft and yeah. I would also familiarize myself with Coral because some people still kind of like it. And speaking of visualization, a great tool that I, I personally think at this point the whole world is moving towards is Tableau. Mm -hmm. If none of you have heard it before, um, it's a data visualization and dashboard development tool that literally I can't think of any large organization that has not tapped into it already and any of the small organizations that are not working towards tapping into it. So that's a great tool that you can, they have an open source um, domain that you can just download and play with and it's, it's pretty user friendly so that's a great, and I think it's a great skill to have on your resume because the last I heard, Tableau is actually the number one skill that all employers are, like in terms of what are the top three like skills, it's not even data visualization, it's Tableau as a skill, has been the number one thing most employers, and I use it in public health, but I know people who use it in marketing and any other industry that you think of, so that's a great tool to know as well. So a question back there? Go ahead. So um, you talked about starting salaries. So yeah. what can we expect after we graduate and uh, what is reasonable to accept or not to accept? Okay, so um, I think that's really important and I think um, what my experience is in is in sales, right? So I think with any organization that you're going to join, you need to understand how they make money. You need to understand who the end user is of this product. Is it, um, is it going to be the government? Is it going to be Medicare? Is it going to be um, an oncology team? Is it going to be um, a patient who's not actually paying? Is it going to be a, a managed care? Figuring out how they set their price point and how the um, money moves in is how you can sort of guesstimate what your value is, right? So um, I've always worked in sales and um, I think that so I haven't found a better way to make money than being the direct person who you know brings in a certain amount of money for um, the company. So I'm staying comfortably in sales, but my first job five years ago with um, Myriad, um, my base salary was 90, and they gave me a car allowance and a, um, you know just I tried to find whoever was making the most money and. Um, you know, and I talked to my colleagues beforehand, and once I got to know them well enough, saying, what do you think is reasonable to start out? Um, so I don't know anybody who did a lot higher than that walking right out of grad school. And then I switched jobs frequently. I was always looking. So does it look good to have three companies on your resume after five years? No, but I doubled my base salary every time I moved. So for me, it worked out all right. You know, when we talk about loyalty, I laugh all the way to the bank because that's you know like I you know I look all out for me because that's what they do and the company could be gone overnight. I would not suggest working for Myriad because I don't think they have the best technology anymore. But go anywhere that you think you can learn, and I, I don't know. Just it varies so much with what you want to do. What do you want to do? Well. Um, to know it sounds good. Yes. <laughs> yes. Personalized medicine. Yes. So how can you make yourself um, the most valuable on personalized medicine? You know, is um, is, is science? Uh, you know, are you a scientist? Is that the best base for your um, skill set? Are you good at um, project management? Is that the best um, fit for your skill set? How do you feel called that you could best help um, in that? 
group. For me, it was always connecting the end user with the, the benefit of the product because that, and you can also see ahead of time like how well the company's doing if things aren't selling, like you can kind of decide that you may want to move on as well, so. But if you're not in a sales job, I can guarantee you, you probably won't start at what she started at. So don't get your hopes up too high on that. Glassdoor is a great resource for what is like the average salary that's paid for your industry, but that also changes by city. A person for making what they're making for a project manager in New York is not going to make the same amount in Baltimore. Cost of living adjusts that a lot, so make sure to look at what the average salary is. And you can probably push for a little more than the than what the average is on the upward limit, just and more than anything else because of your Hopkins brand on there. So, so my biggest suggestion would be just know how much you want to make and ask for it unapologetically. Just like I, what I did when I was getting hired on for my position right now after my fellowship. I said X amount or nothing and if not that I'm walking out. I'm not even negotiating. And they put that money on the table and they've never put that for anybody else. And nobody had the experience, I mean I didn't have the experience that the other people do. So it's not like I walked in there having like the most impressive resume with everything they wanted. I did not. But I was taught, I, I had a good coach in that, but I was taught to know my worth and then apologetically just say how much I'm worth and ask for that and never back down on that amount. And I got it. So I'll tell you guys, just be confident and ask for what you want. Yeah. I think that's, that's a really good uh, point. Like if you're confident in your own skill set and have a certain amount of pride in your knowledge and your work, um, it's not going to come off as, can I get this X amount of money? No, it's more like, I want this much money. And if they want to come back with, oh no, we can't pay you that much, then you can hit them with something like, okay, so what, what do I need to do to get that money from you? You know? So what if I, st and this was one of the conversations I had with some of my, uh, pe some of the people I was talking to as well, like, oh, oh, you're talking about going down 10 10 k than what I asked, suppose, for example. So I'm saying, okay, I'll go down five, and in six months, if I've achieved this, 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 and this, you give me what I asked for. That's another way of doing it. Um, because now they, now you have proved your skill set to them, and also, even if they don't, you work there six more months, you get them on your resume, and you keep looking. Like she said, LinkedIn, it's great. You know what, honestly, even if you don't spend time on LinkedIn, like every single day, Having a good looking profile on there is going to get you a call from a recruiter very often. Like incredibly often. So now recruiters calls, but nobody was calling me. Right. Everybody would have told me, here's the door. If I would have said, well, I'm leaving if you don't give me X, Y, Z. Right, no. Um, in the very beginning, I don't, I'm not even sure I could pull that um, now, but I think um, I treated the interviewing like being in a very, very open relationship. I told one girl about the other girl and I said, look, I am, um, I'm over here with this company. They're going to make a decision in two weeks. Some of it was true. Most of it was true. Maybe none of it was true. <laughs> but I would say, you know, I'm, I'm interviewing with LabCorp, your competitor, uh, Myriad. I know you hate to lose. But I'm also interviewing with these people and they're offering about 85. But I like you more. And so I would work for you for 90. And I think based, and I just learned one sentence, based on my education experience, I think 90 would be a good fit. I think that that's where we should go. And then I'd zip it, and it's painful, because sometimes you have to do it over the phone, you can't do it in person. But zipping it, and the next person who goes bleh, 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 loses. And they will, and if, if, right, so maybe you don't walk out at um, 90, but if you walk out at 85, you're still gonna be able to pay the bills. The second job I got, um, I remember, so I was, the second job I got, and this is the, the better way to do it, is to create the job before it's posted, right? So I went out and I saw, I was, I think I was following Fierce Biotech, and I saw that Nant Health had a um, whole genome um, molecular tu tumor profile coming up for commercialization. And I contacted them, and which I, I mean, looked kind of smart, and I said, look, um, I'm doing this for Myriad and hereditary cancer screenings. I think we can do more. Here's what I know in the area. This is what I do best for Myriad. I want to bring your technology to DC. I think I'm a good channel for doing that. And um, they were like, oh, well, we didn't even know that people knew that this was coming. It's like, yeah, I read this, this, and this. I want to sell this for you. I want to bring this to you. 
and I was actually the one of the first emails at nethealth.com because everyone else they were still combining companies and I remember I was um, uh, they had phoned me out to um, <laughs> they had phoned me out to California on like my third round interview and I kept thinking any second they're gonna figure out that I don't know what I'm talking about <laughs> and um, I went through the interview process and um, I was five months pregnant and so I was like wearing this like shifty dress and I told the baby like look mommy's gonna buy you a car if you just like stay in there today keep it nice tight <laughs> nice quiet and tight today don't tell anybody about yourself and so I interviewed I think it was four or five I think I was seven months pregnant by the time I got the interview and I was like surprise not chubby I'm you know, pregnant and um, I, that morning before the last round of interviews, I didn't even realize that it wasn't much of an interview. It was more like a meet and greet because it was a smaller company. I love smaller companies. They tell you, they, they just, they're a little bit more honest. And I left and I seriously, I was in my hotel room and I had to say, and I'm coming, you know, from Myriad, and I didn't think Myriad was gonna, they were about to announce layoffs and I knew I was on the chopping block within like a month, here I am pregnant, and I did the baby thing on my own, so I'm single and pregnant. And um, like you're not, you're not feeling your cutest at seven months pregnant. And um, I, before I left, I made certain I did not leave that hotel room until I could say in the mirror without smiling, in a straight face, because I had to be ready for that question because I didn't know when I was going to work it in. But before I left, I wanted to, them to know how much money I would be happy with. Because when somebody gives you an offer, they want you to be ecstatic about it, right? The best way to negotiate is set up front. This is what I want to make, and this is what would make me really happy. You want this too. And so before I left, I said, you know, based upon my education and experience, I think a base salary of $150,000 is uh, where we should be at. Now, there were no other employees. There was nobody else selling. So I set the market for everybody else who was coming. There were only four people that they were going to hire. Um, and since then, NetHealth has done uh, layoffs, too. But the, the point is, is that even before they had set up, I made it easy for them. I said, look, this is how much I want to make. This is how much you know I would be happy with, you would be happy with. And I even got to set the price and set the um, opportunity. I would just like to add one small uh, caveat to everything she said because, of course, um, if you're going into industry, that kind of stuff works really, really well, um, especially when you are very careful about uh, you know the words you use and the numbers you say. Try. I, I always um, like to say try and be careful when you're shopping your offers around uh, because it's a small world, especially in things like bioinformatics. There are not too many people. Um, you might be getting hired by people who used to work together, yeah. say, 12 to 15 years ago. And, and, or less. Yeah, yeah or less, risk. you know. There's um, risk everywhere. Yeah, so you might not want to use a number that's an outright lie uh, to try and get them to pay you more. That, that may not be the best idea because, for all you know, they're going out and having drinks tonight. <laughs> um, it's a small world, just always be mindful of that. Yeah, I mean, do your best not to burn bridges because right. all of these people, I mean, eventually the higher up you go, I mean, everybody knows everybody. Yeah, and again, take advantage of the carrier services. I feel like I'm marketing for them at this point. But <laughs> yeah. I agree. Um, take advantage of them because they will teach you. I learned this the hard way because I left Hopkins by then. And yeah, I had a coach who was teaching me how to negotiate better. but. It helps to know what are the different things you can negotiate. You don't only have to negotiate your salary. There's a million other things that you can negotiate for. Like she said, you know, like six months, you know, like raise or a bonus. You can talk about transportation, work from home options, number of CTO days. There's a lot of things you can negotiate that don't necessarily, if you're fixated on the amount, you can work around that amount and actually make a lot more in the process by finding these other ways. Um, you just need to know how either to negotiate or what are those options that you have, and you can only know that if somebody who's done it or knows it can tell you that. So take advantage of the care resource for that. Right. I think one more question, and then um, Sarah said that you all have to meet each other because we're doing networking here, and I want to make sure there's time for everybody to network. So it's so one more question. If not, can you join me in thanking our panelists? They did fabulous job. Thank you.